Bonjour, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we, we, it's, it's my, my pleasure to welcome everybody to Kodesria. My, my name is Ibrahim Asal. I think we know each other, most of the people. Uh, we have the, the, the great pleasure of having Professor Walter Turner with us here today. Uh, usually we do meetings like this, we hold them outside. But this is uh, the second day of Ramadan, uh, at least for most people, and the third day for some. And we, we thought at so short notice, and uh, it being a Ramadan, you know, we should be realistic about the number of people we should be expecting at this, at this seminar. So we said, let's just do it in the conference room and reorganize it slightly. Uh, but, but usually we, we, we do this outside and you know, for to, to have space for a lot more people. But we are very pleased that you, you know, all of you are able to be here. Uh, and uh, Prof, you can just know how, how pleased we are to, because of your presence here. We've been able to bring back people <laughs> who, who are part of this family but who have been so difficult to bring around. I'm thinking about you know, Professor Akwasi Ayudu and uh, Sharif here. And, uh, Sheikh Nyang is uh, you know, present all of the time. We have Prof Bari. Uh, Dembele and Bernard Funu are more, much more frequent here. But it's really a pleasure welcoming everybody. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, we, we, we want to keep this uh, pretty short. Uh, we leave time for a discussion, of course, if, if, if you see the need for continuing a little bit. And so the only thing I want to say is at, at Kodestria, it's uh, really a privilege to have somebody like you here today, uh, because it is really uh, an opportunity to open a discussion. Uh, on an issue that is really very fundamental, which we have not addressed properly in our own programs. Uh, I mean, uh, we, 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 we are interested in, in issues related to the African diaspora. We work very closely with you know, um, um, colleagues in the diaspora. Uh, but there are issues uh, that, the, that are very, very important to the diaspora, and also even on to, 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 to people on the continent, uh, on which research, social research on the continent hasn't really have been taking as much interest as I think they, we ought to have, and, and certainly the problem of prisoners is one of those of those kinds of issues. Uh, so it's I think uh, very 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 good that we to, to have you here to introduce you know to introduce this topic and give, and give a talk about it. Uh, but I can and I can show you that from here we will we will take it up we will take it up as a serious research issue, uh, and we will be calling upon you uh, for for advice and on how to work on that kind of issue in the, in the context of the U.S. Uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity to, to do something you know, important on this particular topic. So I'd like to thank Firoz for organizing everything. Uh, um, Firoz, for those of the colleagues who don't know him, joined Kodesria as head of Kodis a couple of months ago and uh, um, has been doing a great job since he came on board. Uh, with us here also is um, uh, Bernard Mupasi Lututala, Professor Lututala, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary of Kodesria. And, uh, um, I think when we open the discussion afterwards, as people speak, they will introduce themselves so that we don't you know, take a lot more time from this uh, introductory moment. But Kodesa is 40 years old this year, uh, a Pan-African Social Science Research Council that was established on the initiative of the African scholars themselves, who felt that they needed a forum and a space where they could meet and interact and discuss issues related to the continent and that are important to the continent, uh, pretty much on our own terms, I mean, without uh, having the the restrictions of the government, uh, remember the, the Africa with all the authoritarian regimes of various kinds, the military dictatorships, single party, life presidents and all that. Uh, and so it was fortunate to have this, the possibility of having a council and establish here in Senegal you know, that can organize and facilitate uh, research and dialogue among African scholars and between the scholars and the policy makers and social movements and civil society. Uh, and we've been trying many things. Uh, our main business is um, social science research and research in the humanities, uh, networks, country level, you know, continental networks, some involving the diaspora, a lot of them actually. Uh, and we also, um, in the context of the crisis, have been you know, running a lot of re research uh, capacity enhancement programs over the, over the years. Aminat Jawi here is the person in charge of that. And we publish as well. All that is on the Corazina website, and I'm sure you've already uh, you know, familiarized yourself with, with the things we do. 
but I'd really like to thank you very much for, for taking time uh, to, to be with us here and to give us an opportunity to have a very, you know, uh, to hear all the great things you're doing and the, 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 you know, the, uh, on this important topic, but also to sensitize us really definitely to, to the need to do something uh, you know, about it uh, from a programmatic point of view. And, and I can assure you we'll do that. But um, I think the people will do a more formal introduction uh, you know, to the uh, colleagues here, uh, who you are and the kind of things you do. Uh, and then, so, yeah. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes, et en particulier à ceux qui uh, et celles qui sont venues de l'extérieur de, de l'Estréa. C'est un grand plaisir pour euh, moi de présider cette euh, réunion et vous, de vous présenter mon collègue et mon ami, euh, le professeur Walter Turner. Veuillez m'excuser si je parle en anglais. Mais le professeur Turner ne parle pas français et évidemment, moi non plus. <laughs> Merci pour votre uh, compréhension. <laughs> the United States currently holds a prison population of 2.7 million people. This is the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. Although the United States constitutes only 5% of the world's population, it constitutes more than 25% of the world's prison population. Between 1980 and the year 2000, the prisoner population of the United States was more than quadrupled. There are more than 100 political prisoners, the majority of, of them African Americans, who languish in, a state, in state and federal prisons and what are called super max prisons. We in the Global South, and especially here in Africa, are acutely aware of the imperialist nature of consecutive US governments. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Libya, the list can go on. To say nothing of the use of drones, the killings of, of civilians, uh, the coups d'etat, the assassinations that is littered our, uh, our history of the last 50 years in which the U.S. has played a central uh, uh, role. But what we often forget is that the, that the domestic manifestation of imperialism, the domestic manifestation of empire, is racism. And the descendants of our people from this continent, the African Americans, amongst those who most violently and most brutally face the horrors of racism. Professor Turner arrived in Dakar a week ago, supposedly on holiday. <laughs> as, as, I, as I couldn't think of a better way for us to enjoy his holiday, I took the liberty of inviting him to come and speak to us on his experience of uh, political prisoners and the incarcerations of African Americans in the US. Uh, you all have information, I hope, about uh, Professor Turner, but he's he is a, a professor of social science and contemporary African affairs in a, a university in, in California and is a leading authority on contemporary African affairs. For those of you who don't know it, I strongly recommend uh, you, you uh, look up and, and follow his, uh, his outstanding uh, um, weekly radio program called Africa Today, which is broadcast on uh, um, Pacific, Pacifica Radio. Uh, specifically kpfa.org. Um, he's worked as a journalist in many parts of the world, including uh, in South Africa, Kenya, Cuba, Nigeria, and he's worked uh, um, also in uh, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Jordan, Mali, Syria, Senegal, Vietnam, the list goes on. He was uh, the media director for uh, Madiba Nelson Mandela's visit to California in 1990. And amongst other publications, he's the author of No Easy Victories, African Liberation and African Activists Over the Half Century, 1950 to 2000. Um, he's a recipient of many uh, awards, including the Martin Luther King 
uh, award, a humanitarian award and the Golden Bell Award. He's also a contributing author of uh, Codestria's forthcoming book on the legacy of uh, Amilcar Cabrera. Walter will speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open the floor up for, for, for discussions. Uh, nous avons un, uh, un entrepreneur qui uh, va intervenir de temps à autre. Uh, please welcome Walter Turner. Yeah, it is a honor and a uh, uh, privilege uh, to be able to address this esteemed organization. Uh, you know, I, I do confess that I have known of Codestria. Uh, for many, many years, I have seen your publications and uh, followed your work. Uh, I'm hopeful that this uh, forum that we'll have, however brief that it will be, uh, will provide the basis for discussing what many uh, advocates like myself consider to be among the most pressing social issues in the United States today, uh, incarceration, uh, torture, and the extrajudicial assault on black, brown, and poor people in the United States. Donc le thème qui va nous réunir aujourd'hui, comme vous le savez, c'est euh, les prisonniers politiques et les tortures parmi les populations noires aux États-Unis constituent un thème très actuel. I, I want to publicly thank my uh, good friend uh, Feroz Manji, uh, who invited me to speak and has given me an opportunity uh, to broaden my vacation experiences. Monsieur <laughs> mon ami Feroz, qui m'a donné l'occasion de I have worked with Feroz for many years. I, uh, I recall asking him recently, where did we meet? And he told me that actually I had awakened him one morning at 6 o'clock in a hotel uh, with a call. And his work has certainly been fruitful to uh, African people around the world, and I appreciate that very much. I, I'd also like to recognize my also other good friend here, uh, Professor Demba Dembele, uh, uh, who I've organized events for and uh, when he's been in the United States. Uh, and consider him to be one of the people that when we're having discussions on economic issues or global issues, uh, he's one of the first people I think of. Uh, on J July 8th, uh, which is, began this week, the uh, California prisons uh, will be going on a strike. There are approximately 33 prisons in California with a population of about 150,000 men. This month is historically referred to in the African American communities as Black August. Ce mois est connu par la communauté d'Africains américains comme étant le mois d'août, le tout noir, comme on l'a connu de ce temps noir. This has been a month of historic African resistance uh, tied to the revolt of Nat Turner uh, in the 19th century, as well as to the Attica prison strike in the 1970s and the assassination of uh, George Jackson, who was in San Quentin prison. Donc c'est un mois qui est lié à la, euh, euh, la résistance de la population américaine, noire notamment. Et Il y a également avec la rébellion de Nat Turner et l'assassinat de George Jackson et les événements de la prison de Attica en 1911. The strike which is going on now in California, and at last call there were approximately 30,000 prisoners participating in it which represents essentially one quarter of the population, almost one quarter of the prison population in California. It, it, it really represents, the, the strike was called by prisoners who are in an institution which is referred to as Pelican Bay. C'est une grève qui a été appelée par des prisonniers détenus dans une prison appelée Pelican Bay. Hein? 
Pelican Bay is one of these institutions that has been constructed over the last 30 to 40 years, which is referred to as a supermax institution. Uh, Marion in Kansas, Lawrence, etc. We refer to them as the supermax institutions. Meaning that these are institutions where there'll be no human contact. Where your shower, where your food, all of it will come without you having any human contact in any way, shape, or form. As the events in 1971 at Attica were, the events that are occurring right now in California must be placed in a larger political context. The program of the FBI, which was referred to as the COINTELPRO program, was specifically designed to disrupt, to destroy, and to make ineffective organizations that were fighting for the voices of African Americans, of brown Americans, and of the poor. The executive director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, declared in the uh, early 1960s that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. Obviously an exaggerated claim. Le directeur du FBI au début des années 60 avait déclaré que le parti Black Panther constituait la plus grande menace à la sécurité intérieure des États-Unis. The exaggerated claim was designed to unleash the repressive forces of the state at the local, state, and national levels, disrupt the media, and to destroy the work of the Black Panther Party and its allies. Cette déclaration donc a été très exagérée, a été saisie comme étant un alibi pour déchaîner toutes les forces répressives au niveau national, local, au niveau étatique et contre les médias pour lutter contre et détruire le travail que le parti Black Panther était en train de mener au sein des populations noires. Uh, George Jackson, the author of Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye, was the leader of the San Quentin Prison chapter of the Black Panther Party. George Jackson, donc, qui était l'auteur de Soledad Brother and the Blood in My Eye, Était le leader de la section de la prison Saint-Quentin au sein du parti Black Panther. After his murder in 1971, prisoners in Attica State Prison went on strike to demand rights and improvements in their incarceration. Donc, après son assassinat en 1971, les prisonniers de la prison de Attica sont allés en grève pour exiger des droits. Uh, elementary and the amelioration of their conditions of incarceration to uh, make a light of the connection between the level of incarceration and the political conscience that is necessary with the militantism among the community American. The United States, as Feroz noted, I, I should note one personal note here. Uh, I was also a member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, <laughs> And that many of the people that I talk about who still remain incarcerated uh, were people who I knew and worked with. So it is, uh, it certainly has a personal character to it. Uh, the United States currently holds a prison population of 2.7 million, the highest incarceration rates of any country in the world. Although the United States constitutes just 5% of the world's population, it constitutes more than 25% of the world's prison population. Between 1980 and 2000, the prisoner population of the United States more than quadrupled. The federal prison population of the United States has grown by more than 800%. All of this data speaks to an era when a number of criminal and justice policies were put in place that were designed to send more people to prison 
and to design policies that would ensure that they would stay in prison. Politically, these last 20 to 30 years of incarceration have represented a competition by politicians as to who could be the toughest on crime and who could incarcerate the most people. A number of key events are important in placing this incarceration surge into an historical political context and understanding the specific impact on the African American community. Much of the activity of the last 20 years has been manifested of what's referred to as the war on drugs, a theme and action which was first voiced by President Richard Nixon at the beginning of the 1970s. The war on drugs represented two key themes. One was to criminalize poor and black communities that were impacted by drugs, and secondly, to create the notion that drugs were a national issue that the government should use all unchecked resources in order to defeat. The brunt of the punishment for drugs fell upon the communities of African American and Latino American communities. Two thirds of all the people of color, African American and Latino populations who are in prison have been sentenced to drug offenses. The three strikes laws, which came about in the 1970s and the 1980s, established specific mandatory min minimums for which the court was not allowed to deviate from, and that was the basis of sentencing, meaning that after your second strike, your third strike, when you received your third strike, then a 25-year sentence was mandatory. Indeterminate sentencing, meaning people receiving sentences that range from five to 20 years, with the only solution to their release being a decision by a racist parole board. In the case of political prisoners, people such as Sundiata Okoli and others who I've spoken to have spent more than 40 years in prison, and the chances that they will be paroled are virtually non-existent. There is a new dialogue on incarceration and black political prisoners and political prisoners generally that is being led by a variety of forces in the United States today. At last count, we could talk about more than 100 political prisoners, the more majority of them African Americans. They're in state and federal prisons and supermax prisons. Many of these incarcerated people were members of the Black Liberation Movement and, in fact, the Black Liberation Army. They include names like Eddie Conway, Herman Bell, Mutulu Shakur, Mumia Abu Jamal, Chip Fitzgerald, who is the longest held Black Panther, a member who's been held in California State Prison since 1968, Rochelle McGee, Albert Woodfox, Herman Wallace. Both of these members are members of what we call the Angola Three. These are three men. One of them was released after 29 years. The other two have served more than 40 years in solitary confinement. Sekou Odinga, Sundiata Okoli. Sekou Odinga was charged with masterminding the escape of Asaya Shakur, Jamil El Amin, Russell Maroon Schultz, and many others. Political prisoners also include people such as Oscar Lopez Rivera of the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, Leonard Peltier of the American Indian Movement, and comrades like David Gilbert and Lynn Stewart. Our comrade Marilyn Buck uh, was released last year. Uh, she died shortly uh, after being released uh, because of cancer. Brothers like Pete O'Neill and sisters like Asada Shakur live in exile outside of the United States. The impact of mass incorporation on black and brown communities is devastating. In 2000, over 2 million children had an incarcerated parent. But to today, the figure has skyrocketed to more than 8.3 million. In the United States, one out of every 28 children has at least one incarcerated parent. And in the black community, one in every nine children has an incarcerated parent. Just five years ago, that figure was one in every 15. It's one in every nine. In 2007, one in every 48, 42 Latino children had an incarcerated parent. But today, a Latino child is three times as likely 
to have an incarcerated parent as a white child. Families are torn apart. The communities are scarred. There are many reasons for these stark statistics. The rate of incarcerating women, principally black and brown women, in the United States, this is the fastest rate of incarceration in the United States, has increased by over 122 percent in the past 10 years. The increase for men during that same period was 76 percent. Part of these new voices and louder voices around the campaign of incarceration and solitary confinement have been highlighted by people such as Mumia Abu Jamal, the case of the Angola Three. Um, there is a new film that's out on Mumia Abu Jamal, which I would like to get to you. Uh, there is a film which I will leave with you today, uh, which is a film uh, which was done many years ago on COINTELPRO. I will leave that with my good friend Perose. Recent writings by Sophia Buhari of the Jericho Movement and the increased work of the Hands Off Asada campaign have made this issue more present. Angela Davis has also spoken very actively and strongly. You might note uh, we have been doing a number of campaigns around Asada Shakur, uh, www.handsoffasada.org, uh, I believe. Asada uh, Shakur is an African American woman uh, who was a member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. Uh, she was arrested on the turnpike in 1972 in New Jersey. Um, her companion was killed. Uh, one of her other companion, uh, the Sundi Adel Kohli, was captured and has done more than 40 years. Asada Shakur was captured. She was shot while her arms were held up. She was transferred to an all-male prison where eventually in the late 1970s she was broken out by a number of different people, many of whom were serving time. Asada Shakur is currently in the country of Cuba where she has been giving political exile. Uh, she has been Cuba since at least the late 1970s. Uh, it was only a few weeks ago that the United States government up the bounty on Asada Shakur to $2 million and placed her name on the FBI's most wanted list. This is the first woman to be placed on the FBI's most wanted list. Another campaign which we were all engaged in was the case of the San Francisco Eight. These were eight African American men, members of the Black Panther Party, uh, who were accused of an assault on a police station in San Francisco in the 1960s. In the late 1960s, they were taken to New Orleans. Uh, they were tortured, they were tortured, they were beaten, they were water tortured until they confessed. The court threw those cases out because the, uh, the confession was arrived at via torture. In 2000, the court rebrought those charges again against these eight men. And through the luck and through the work of people like uh, uh, Sophia Elijah and many other people, we were able to uh, release those particular men. The campaign has also accelerated uh, because we've seen more repression, uh, particularly with the war on terror, uh, which came after the events in 2000 uh, in the United States, as well as these new directives from what we refer to as homeland security. The dialogue around incarceration has also been heightened by the links made between U.S. policies at home and U.S. policies abroad. At the same time that there has been a militarized policy by the United States government in the Middle East and Africa, there has been a militarized policy in the United States. State and local governments have requested and received more monies for video monitoring, for drones, for tanks, for larger jails and larger prisons. In fact, the strongest union in the state of California is the prison guard union, and many states asked to have a prison built in their community because it brings jobs and it brings income. African American organizations and their allies have also made the connection between the contradictions of the case of Luis Posadas Carillas. This is a, an agent which was working for the U.S. government who was involved in the bombing of a Cuban airliner in 1975, killing everyone who has now been given asylum by the United States government. It's impossible to say that you are against terror when you are harboring terrorists. And we need to constantly be reminded that the oldest terrorist 
and the longest terrorist in organization in the world is the Ku Klux Klan. And it was formed in the United States in 1867. These organizations have highlighted the growing militarization of the United States policy in the Middle East, and particularly around the issue of AFRICOM. Uh, you know well more about AFRICOM than I do, because you see it firsthand here on the, on the African continent. Finally, there have been links made between the case of the Cuban Five, the Cuban Four, and the incarceration of growing numbers of African American men and women. From a very different angle, communities who have faced massive budget cuts are questioning the massive expenditures that are going into prison, especially monies that are being spent on the elderly. Last week in New York, um, there was a gentleman who was 88 or 89 years old who was sentenced to 15 years in prison. The figures are that if the rate of people over 55, that incarceration increases by 2030, we're talking over several hundred thousand people who will be senior citizens. One of, the, one of these who's incarcerated in New York is practically in a coma and is handcuffed to the bed. This is one of the issues that has struck the uh, U.S. community at large, not specifically those of us who are African American. The United States continues to deny to the world that there are political prisoners within its borders. It maintains its position at whatever cost necessary. Recall many years ago, the almost immediate removal from office of a U.S. Uh, ambassador to the United Nations, Andrew Young, when he publicly acknowledged the existence of political prisoners. As a general rule, political prisoners have been given the harshest sentences possible. Journalist Mumia Abu-Jamal, a former Panther and staunch supporter of the MOVE members who were bombed by Philadelphia police in 1984, is on death row in Pennsylvania for defending himself and his brother from a vicious beating by the local Philadelphia police. At this point, Mumia Abu-Jamal has been given a sentence that the, uh, he will uh, not receive the death penalty, but he will be in prison for the rest of his life. This was as of 2011. Geronimo Gijaga Pratt, uh, who recently passed away in the country of Tanzania, was sentenced to life despite his exemplary prison record and despite the fact that it was clear that COINTELPRO had arranged the story around Geronimo Pratt. Sekou Odinga, a political prisoner, was sentenced to life plus 40 years. Ashada Shakur and Sundiata Koli were sentenced to life plus 30 years. Each of the MOVE defendants were sentenced to 100 years. Bashir Hamed and Abdul Majid were sentenced to 25 years to life. Seth Hayes is serving 25 years to life. Baba Odinga is serving 25 years to life. New York Three, Herman Bell, Jaleel Bottom, and Albert Noah Washington were sentenced to 25 years to life. Albert Noah Washington passed away about 10 years ago. Mutulu Shakur has been sentenced to 60 years to life. Kwesi Balagoon has been sentenced to 60 years of life. Many of the people who we're talking about who were African-American political prisoners who were arrested in the 1960s are in their 70s and even older than that. And they still find themselves locked down with no chance of parole and the United States continuing to deny that they are political prisoners. The misuse and overuse of solitary confinement is rapid. Many of the freedom fighters have been held in solitary confinement for decades. The abuse of solitary confinement is so pervasive that recently the New York Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit against the State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision on behalf of a mentally ill man who had been held in solitary confinement for over 14 years. There are still 37 states that impose a death penalty despite its proven barbarism and inhumanity. Like every other aspect of the criminal justice system, black and Latino people are disproportionately sentenced to death in the United States. Police brutality and misconduct are major problems throughout the U.S. Just recently in Cleveland, the Ohio police fired 137 shots at an African-American couple riding in a car, killing both of them. 137 shots. The police falsely claimed 
that a shot had been fired at them. The list of black men and Latino men murdered by the police is endless, and those beaten and violated and falsely accused is so numerous as become the expected intrusion in one's life for our people. Police no longer think that the Constitution even applies to black and brown people. Just this year, the New York City Police Chief, Ray Kelly, said that he didn't know of an, al an alternative to the unconstitutional practice of racist stop and frisk. There is an organization which hopefully at some point you will have an opportunity to uh, invite to engage with you. Uh, that is the Malcolm X Grassroots Organization. Uh, they are based in New York, but they have offices around the United States. Hopefully you will also have an opportunity to, to invite uh, Sophia Elijah, uh, who uh, is served as the attorney for Sekou Asundi uh, Koli. She is currently the attorney for Asada Shakur, um, and to engage with them. Malcolm X Grassroots Organization has uh, published a report which is entitled Every 36 Hours. Malcolm X Grassroots under Organization undertook a study that noted that every 36 hours in the United States, every 36 hours, 36 hours, that there is an extrajudicial killing of a black person in the United States. They point out that these killings happen without due process and virtually receive no media at all. There's currently a case which is being televised in the United States, which is the case of uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, which is in the jury at this point. Uh, there is a case of Oscar Grant, who was shot on a subway car uh, with a video of him being shot and the police officer was not convicted. In fact, the police officer left, left town until they were able to uh, commandeer him back. The case of Oscar Bluford in Oakland, the case of Sean Bell, who was killed when he was at a celebration for his wedding, and countless others throughout the United States. In regards to stop and frisk, it is a law in New York and a policy in New York that allows the New York police to stop people upon suspicion and to frisk them. In 2010, blacks and Latinos were stopped at an 80% higher rate than whites. And while 8% of whites that were stopped were frisked, 80% of African Americans that were stopped were frisked. Although the black population of New York represents about 13% of New York's population, it represents about 56% of the people in prison. The California prison population, about 150,000, three out of every four people in the California prison is either black or brown. More than 60% of those in prisons and jails in the United States are African Americans, and one out of every 10 African Americans who is beyond 30 years of age is in prison or jail. The participants who are undertaking the strike in California this week have vowed not to eat until their key demands are met. They want an end to the special housing unit, which is referred to as a SHU, which is solitary confinement. There are 10,000 people in California who are in the SHU. Who knows when you'll be released? You're in an eight by 10 cell. Your food comes to you through a slot. You may get out once a week if your record is good. One of the ways which they've been uh, allowing people to get out of the shoe is by implicating other people in the prison in gang activities. It's what they call the snitch jacket. They include, the other demands include an end to group punishment, administrative abuse, abolition of the debriefing policy, um, and a adequate food and other constructive activities. In 2011, the strike went on and it stopped. There were 6,000 prisoners who refused food. Over the last two years, they've been talking with the California prison authorities to try to come about with some uh, solution. Most prisoners, and certainly most political prisoners, confine themselves confined in what we call the maximum or the super maximum prisons. And I got a call yesterday, as of yesterday, as of today, this morning, July 10th. More than 30,000 prisoners are still on strike in California. 
the use of the term post-racial America by key political leaders, including the recent visitor to your country, President Barack Obama, are designed to highlight a false notion that institutional racism and its social, political, and economic manifestations have changed dramatically in the last decades. No such assessment could be further from the truth. The intensification of incarceration and the ongoing assaults on black and brown communities are proof positive. In fact, there are two states, California and New York, that allow men who are 16 and 17 years old to be tried as adults and to be incarcerated as adults. Meaning these are young men that once they find themselves as 16 or 17 year old in the prison system, find themselves to the most subject to the most violent abuses. The criminal justice system is intensely dedicated to holding African American freedom fighters behind bars and destabilizing their communities and allies who would stand for human rights at both home and abroad. Sundiata Coley and Herman Bell are not just incarcerated, uh, they're not just political prisoners, uh, but they are prisoners of, uh, they are prisoners of war. They're essentially POWs. This should be on the agenda of people throughout the world who stand for human rights and stand for justice. And we certainly appreciate the uh, invite uh, from the Rose. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, Ibrima and others, uh, and my friend Demba, uh, laying out the notion uh, that we can continue uh, this dialogue. Uh, there are bridges to be built around these issues. Uh, there are issues of U.S. policy that impact your communities, um, that impact your individuals, uh, whether they be in northern Mali, uh, whether they be in the DRC, whether they be in Niger, uh, whether they be what's happening in Somalia, whether they be what happened in Cote d'Ivoire, whether they be what happened in Libya, whether they be what happened in uh, Egypt, whether they be what's happening in Brazil, whether they be what's happening in Cuba, they're, we are all on the same page uh, with this notion. And when I met the translator, uh, he said one thing, and I'll, I'll wrap up at this point, he said, first thing he mentioned to me was Henry Thoreau. And of course, Henry Thoreau was a person who said, the only free man in the Nazi society is a man who is in jail. But we always quote Frederick Douglass, uh, the great abolitionist leader of the 19th century. He said, you know, if there is no struggle, uh, there is no progress. People who want progress without, you know, causing roar, uh, you know, there are people who want the ocean without its roar. You know, they want sunshine without the heat. You know, there, it, there must be a struggle. And that comes from Frederick Douglass. So I really want to thank Codesria uh, for taking time uh, to invite me. I hope I've left you with some things that will be valuable in our mutual work.